Thank you for joining us for this MDA Engage Community Webinar on understanding the importance of physical therapy for Becker muscular dystrophy. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. We are thrilled to join us today for this important and educational webinar. The webinar today is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual educational events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing to ensure that those who are not able to join us live today are able to access this information. Please note that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A window to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A bubble to open the window and enter your question. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. As questions come up along the webinar, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our speaker, whom you will meet shortly. I would also like to thank our event supporter, Edgewise. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for your generous support. The Muscular Dystrophy Association is committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular disease. We do this through innovations in care and innovations in science. MDA's research is reach with research is vast. MDA is the largest non-governmental funder of neuromuscular research in the country. To share a little bit specifically, to MDA's work in the BMD research landscape. MDA, since its inception, MDA has invested more than 21 million in BMD research. MDA has spent more than 2.4 million on DMD, DMD and BMD grants in 2019. In 2019, MDA had five active BMD grants. MDA invested nearly $4 million on BMD grants in the last five years. With that foundation, let us review the objectives for today's webinar. Participants will learn how physical therapy can positively impact individuals with Becker muscular dystrophy, discover exercises with individuals that, with indi that individuals with BMD can do at home, and discuss precautions to take around exercising. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Abby Yenzer has been a neuromuscular physical therapist at Washington University for two and a half years and has loved working in the MDA clinic and in neuromuscular research. She has a special connection to this world as her brother, cousin, and late uncle have Becker muscular dystrophy and her, her family has been involved with the MDA for as long as she can remember. Abby enjoys speaking with patients and their families, as well as educating the community on different disorders covered by the MDA. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Abby. If you could please give us a second. There you go. Hi, Abby. Hello. Give me one second and I will stop my share. Okay. Go ahead and share. I'm pulling up. There it is. Maybe. Okay. Hello. So I am Abby. I am a physical therapist and I have worked, like she said, in, in neuromuscle for two and a half years. Um, this has always been my passion. It was the job that I wanted. I grew up around the clinic and 
was inspired by the people who worked with my family. Um, so I'm here today just to share a little bit about what I've learned, not only as a physical therapist uh, in this clinic, but also as the older sister to a brother with Becker. So most of you are aware of what Becker muscular dystrophy is and how it affects you. Um, and if you've got family members with you today, this is more of just a general review. So this is an X-link genetic disorder, which leads to impaired dystrophin protein function within the muscle. And what that means is that the dystrophin protein, which is the largest, one of the largest proteins in the body, um, can't do its job properly. It is a, a force associated protein that, that kind of helps our muscles when we contract and relax. Um, so if, if it starts to not work properly, that's where we start to get that weakness. Um, and then as far as disease progression goes, everyone's gonna be different. Uh, depending on your age and the location of the error within the gene um, will affect where you tend to have the most weakness and what tend to be your biggest limiting factors. Um, primarily the shoulder and hip girdle musculature are what are affected most. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, but the the shoulder girdle and the hip kind of are the beginning of the red there, um, but the affected muscles can go into the forearms and upper legs. Those aren't the only muscles that can be affected, but those are primarily the most affected. Your core muscles will also be affected, which I think a lot of times we overlook the importance of core muscles, especially with balance, walking, um, and transitions between, between positions. So from like sitting to standing, lying to sitting, and those sorts of things. And lastly, the heart and the diaphragm are also fairly affected. Um, and we know that those play a huge role in, in our lives and keeping us going. So we'll touch briefly on those because exercise and physical therapy aren't just about you know strength and mobility, but also about cardiovascular and pulmonary health as well. Um, making sure that we are able to do the things we want to do without any side effects. Okay, so why are you here? Why did you join this webinar? Um, well, because exercise and activity are key to staying as healthy and independent as possible. And that is true whether you have muscular dystrophy or not. Um, you know, if, and that's what this little balance tight rope walker is down here, and I'll discuss that a little bit later. But, you know, planning out your day and understanding energy conservation can allow you to participate in more activities and, and, and events you enjoy. You know, we all make decisions every day. Uh, if I'm going to do a couple extra events around the house, if say I wanted to garden in the morning and do a couple other things, that means there may not be something I can do later. So when we think about your day-to-day -day activities. How can we shift and ask others to do things so that we can be present and participate in those things that mean more to us and that are gonna benefit us in the long run? So the CDC guidelines, um, whether you have a disability or not, remain the same. They say that children need about 60 minutes of moderate activity a day and adults need 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity a week. And what that looks like is whatever you want it to be. Um, just the fact that you're getting active is what's important. And if you are currently not at that level, if 60 minutes a day, if you think of your child or yourself and you're like, oh my goodness, that's not something I could do, start, start where you can. Start, what's, start um, with an amount of time that is manageable for you and build up from there. You don't have to jump in at that recommendation. Uh, and again, the activity that you choose to do is something that you're comfortable with and that's not going to irritate or bother you. Um, and then now we're getting down to my, my tightrope guy. So the phrase, use it or lose it. So disease progression versus disuse atrophy um, use it or lose it applies to everyone, regardless of your disability. Um, 
if you have, so if you've got a neuromuscular disorder, I like to think of that on this side of the tightrope, you know, the progression of that disease at its core, we're not necessarily going to change without genetic therapy, pharmaceuticals, and lots of research. However, the function of your muscles, your cardiovascular health, um, your endurance, those sorts of things, are things that we, we can stay on top of and we can manage. So if we don't, you know, if we're not active, we're not only going to have disease progression, but we're also going to have what's called disuse atrophy. So if we don't use those muscles, we lose them. Um, and that goes kind of along, uh, that also goes along with uh, stretching and flexibility. So if you sit a lot during the day, or if you're in a, in a similar position frequently, the muscles that are shortened in that position are going to stay shortened longer. And then if you don't stretch and don't get out of that position, it's going to be harder to then increase that flexibility. So adding stretching and adding it sooner rather than later is going to improve not only your comfort, but your mobility as well. So if you sit a lot and your hips are tight and then you go to stand, it's gonna be harder to stand because now the muscles that help you stand are fighting those muscles that were shortened while you were sitting. And lastly, um, access to PT. So PT is important for everyone with a neuromuscle disorder. Um, we can not only keep you accountable for your exercises and stretches, um, but we also can monitor any progress or changes in relation to your disease and discuss appropriate exercises. Because like I said in the beginning, all of you are different. Um, how you move is different. How you transfer is different. How you sleep is different. And all of those things are important to your health and well-being. Um, and how you get through your day. So exercise goals, when you, like if you were to go to PT or exercise on your own at home, I would still have someone that you can kind of bounce ideas off of, whether that's your primary care physician, your neurologist if you have one. If you, were, if you go to a MDA care center with a physical therapist, you can definitely commu communicate with them in regards to what sort of exercises you're doing, just to make sure that you're not pushing yourself too hard. Um, we'll talk about things to avoid later, but having a medical professional that you trust and someone who's willing to work with you on these things is really important. So the goals of exercise, like I'd mentioned, cardiopulmonary strength and help, health. Um, so, the cardiac muscle is affected in a portion of those with BMD. If you have a cardiologist, always talk to them before you start something new, um, especially if it is a cardio activity or if you take um, specific cardi cardiac medications. Um, another goal is to maintain your level of strength. Uh, where are you at functionally? You know, how are you transferring? How are you walking? Um, you know, how are you performing your activities of daily living? How can we make them easier? And, and what equipment can we use to, to help with that? And that kind of flows into this next one. So how do you compensate effectively? Um, so if you can't reach up, if you don't have the shoulder strength to reach up, can you prop your arm to assist that elbow up? How can we make those activities functional. Um, and then always remember that the goals that you make for yourself for exercise and physical therapy activities um, need to be to be smart. You know, we don't want to set a goal that we're never going to achieve because that that can be really hard on us mentally. Um, so think about what's going to be best for you, what's going to help you be independent and what's going to help save you energy. That's where you focus your goals around. I also want everyone to find something that they are interested in, you know, not just doing exercise for the sake of exercise, um, 
but something that makes you happy and gets you energized. So if you have a hobby, if you play a sport, if, you know, even if it's not necessarily an overly active hobby, is there a way that you can add a little activity to it just so that you're, you know, you're enjoying what you're doing? And like I said, mental and emotional health are a big part of exercise, um, especially right now in this COVID world where we're all kind of stuck in one place inside so that we can all stay healthy. Um, how can we spend time with others? Can you do it via a webinar like this or Zoom? Um, if you can get out of the house, obviously follow protocols for masks and social distancing, but sometimes getting out of the house can help and just going for a walk or roll down the street um, can all be good things. So as far as, met, you know, it's good for your mental health. I like my repetition there. <laughs> and then exercise can also play into teamwork um, and that team atmosphere, which is also great as far as our emotional and mental health goes. Working together with others is good for us. Okay, so now we're looking more at recommendations for where you're at in life and what your mobility level is. So I'm coming back again to those interests. I, I really want people to focus on what you like to do, not just what you need to do. Um, and then, and kind of incorporate it there. And then where are you at in disease progression? Are you still walking? Can you walk short distances or do you primarily use powered mobility? All of that's gonna affect what type of activity you can do. Um, but by no means do any of those limit you from doing activity. And then what assistant needs do you have and what is the availability of assistance? So if you wanna exercise, but you only have assistance in the morning and you might need assistance to say set up to exercise or to, for someone to drive you somewhere, that is how you're gonna to wanna to schedule that day so that you can utilize that assistance and and participate in those activities you want to do. Other things to consider, what resources are available to you? Do you live near a pool like a YMCA? Um, do you have a neighborhood that you could walk in? Do you have friends in that neighborhood? Do you have a recumbent bike in your house? Do you have someone who can help you get on and off that recumbent bike if that's a challenge for you? Um, you know, it takes a lot of thought when you have a disability as to you know what you want to do what you can do and who's available to help you but if you put in that thought usually we can make things make things work and that's where that PT comes in again you know these we've been trained most of us two or three years on how to you know educate ourselves on what each patient's going through and what their limitations are and, and what we can come up with to make things work for them. So utilize those resources. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit, but where does it fit into your day? If you don't make a space for it, you're never going to do it. If you don't commit to saying, you know, I'm going to do this in the morning at this time, or I'm going to do it, you know, once I get my shoes on or after dinner, it, it gets harder and harder to just say you're going to do it at some point during the day than it is if you actually make a time to do it. Okay, so now getting to the fun stuff, some exercise ideas. If you can walk, just walking is a great exercise, but I want it to be safe. You know, I don't want you to push yourself to try to walk if that's something that's not appropriate for you. Um, swimming, I will forever say that swimming is appropriate for everyone. And it is by far one of the best exercises for people with neuromuscular diseases. It's low impact um, and you can do as much or as little as you need as, a, as is appropriate to you. And sometimes it, that um, you call hydrostatic pressure that the buoyancy of the water can also help relieve some of the tension in, in muscles. And I know that that can be a big issue um, for people with Becker. So, if you have access to a pool, if you have someone who can go with you, and if you have a way to get in and out of that pool, swimming is an awesome, awesome way to stay active. A recumbent bike is also a good option. We discussed that before. It's very low impact, low risk of falling. 
Um, and it's a good way to kind of keep your legs moving, stretched out a little bit, um, as well as get your heart pumping. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go into more restrictions as to how much you should do and what you, you know, what to avoid a little bit later. Um, and then these other ones are kind of, kind of fun. Uh, if you've ever done horseback riding, so they have um, places like Exceptional Equestrians where a therapist of sorts, whether it's a rec recreational therapist or a physical therapist will work with you on horseback riding. And I put that on the other side as well. It is a great core exercise. So if that's something you have available to you, I highly recommend it. And it's, it's a lot of fun too. Safety first though, always wear your helmet. Um, and then adaptive sports. I know lots of kids who've played power soccer, lots of adults who've played power soccer who love it. Um, it was a great way for my brother to get out his aggression on something <laughs> uh, that was able to just bounce off his wheelchair. Um, but they also have other adaptive sports. Um, so many of them that I can't even come up with a list in my head, but looking into adaptive sports in your area, just see if there's, you know, talk to your MBA rep um, and just see what's out there because you never know what you're going to enjoy until you try it. And then active range of motion as a way to maintain mobility is personally one of the easiest things to recommend and to do. So if you can move your body part through a particular range of motion, even if it's just, give a little better example, through here, doing that a couple times, so 10 times is an exercise, that is activity. And if you switch sides, come back and do another set of reps, move on to another body part, that, that is exercise, that's activity, and that's a way to help maintain that movement and keep those joints healthy. Um, but again, I want you to stick with whatever you choose to do. So you need to make it something that you enjoy. Um, how can, I always say, how can we make that happen? How can we get you active and also keep you invested in it? So I've got a couple examples of good PT specific exercises, something someone would recommend to you um, if you were to see them in clinic. Now again, if you see them in clinic, it's gonna be a little more specific based on what your needs are. But like I said, the core is affected. The core is an incredibly important part of our body that without that, without our core strength, it gets even harder to move our arms and our legs because that's sort of our stability. So if we don't have that stability, you can't reach up because it just wants to go and, and not support you. Um, I usually recommend not to do sit-ups. Um, I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule across muscular dystrophy, but it is, it's just a lot of strain on your back. Um, and there are so many better and more functional exercises you can do um, to improve your core strength. The first one is rolling. If you're able to roll, whether it's in bed, rolling from one side to the other, um, depending on the size of your bed, don't roll off your bed, please. Um, safety first, or if you're able to get on and off the floor, rolling is, is actually a core exercise. Um, other things you can do is seated reaching. So if you sit nice and tall in your chair, in your wheelchair, and reach forward to grab something within, you know, your, your ability, don't push yourself, don't fall out of the chair. Um, make sure you've got someone there with you if you are doing something that you know is challenging. You know, we, we don't want any falls because that just sets us back um, and makes things harder when the whole goal of this is to make things a little bit easier on us. But reaching forward, reaching to the side, kind of leaning outside of that um, center of gravity a little bit works all of those core muscles. So just leaning side to side, forward and back, reaching out and reaching to the side. Um, another one is turning. So turning your torso left and right, trying to look as far as you can one direction, that's gonna use those oblique muscles. Um, and again, it's not some crazy heavy exercise. It's, it's simply moving, we'll get those muscles going. 
So like I said, shoulders moving through that available range of motion, um, whether that's overhead, out to the side, or even if it's just to the height of your shoulder, or even if it's just, you know, maybe that, let's see if I can get a little more picture, just moving your arm away from your body. All of that movement is working those muscles and keeping those joints as healthy as possible. Um, an arm bike, or if you've ever seen those little pedal bikes that people put on the floor in front of them while they're watching TV and they pedal, you can put those on a table and pedal with them as well. Um, so they can go on the floor or the table. It's essentially like a recumbent bike, um, but instead of your feet out in front of you, they're on the ground, but you still get to sit supported, whether it's in your wheelchair, um, on like in a kitchen table chair or a couch, just have good posture would be my main. Um, recommendation with that. And then we've got your hips, so moving kind of down through the body. Like this picture demonstrates, you could do some marching and sitting. Um, if that's too hard for you, don't push it. I know, like I said, the hip girdle, um, hip flexors can be really tight, they can be painful, um, and they can be weak. So if, if what he's doing there is absolutely not something that you can do, ignore that picture. That's, that's not there for you, but there may be someone here that that would be a good exercise for. Um, and again, moving through that available range, you can lay on your back and pull your knee up to your chest or out to the side, um, cross your legs over one another, pump your ankles up and down, bend your knees. All of that is going to be exercise, joint movement, um, and then leg lifts. So if you think about laying on your side, and lifting your leg up, or even in standing, lifting your leg out to the side or in front of you. Um, but with that, those are, those are higher level exercises. So they're really gonna challenge your balance and your hip strength. If this is something that's appropriate for you, make sure you've got something to hold on to. Um, it's not all about how, th that particular exercise is not about balance. It will challenge your balance, but it's not, it's not necessarily meant specifically for balance. So hold on to something, um, do the appropriate amount of reps for you. Don't push yourself and make sure you're safe if you do those. Um, and if you feel like that's something you're interested in doing, if that's something that's within your wheelhouse, definitely talk to a PT first because they can make sure that you're doing them the right way, you have the right posture, things that I can't necessarily do over a webinar. Um, but I definitely think that they're great exercise and good for those hips if, you, if that's something that's appropriate. Balance is going to come along with that hip strength. Um, we have several different parts of our body that allow us to have balance. We've got these semicircular canals in our ears with fluid where if you tilt your head to the side, it's like, wait a second, I'm not upright and that sends signals to your brain we have nerves that go to your ankles that tell your body if you're walking on grass or if you step on a stone. Um, and then we have our muscles that, that kind of help us keep upright. So challenging all of those systems can help with our balance, but you also have to remember what your limitations are. You know, your limitations for balance are most likely muscular. Um, and so addressing those challenges are gonna be most appropriate for you. And now I'm sure everyone's favorite topic is stretching. Um, stretching is super, super important, especially if you are starting an exercise program, if you're going to be active, definitely want to stretch. Um, I stretch every single day, even if I don't work out, uh, just because I know I will feel better the next day. I'll feel more able to do the things that I want to do. Um, it can help relieve that tension and muscle tightness. It's not perfect. It's not going to make all of your pains go away because some of your pains are related specifically to that Becker muscular dystrophy. And while stretching is great, know that it's not going to, like you're not doing it wrong if it's not making every pain go away. That, you know, that's just part of that of this disease and, and that's something you should be talking to your neurologist or your primary care physician about. Um, so how do we stretch? Well, it depends on your mobility level. So if you are in a wheelchair, 
you can stretch in your wheelchair. If you've got the, um, the feet that come up, you can set your feet on a chair in front of you to stretch. Um, you can have a family member or aid help you stretch. Um, if you can get in bed and stretch, it's not ideal because that bed kind of sinks, but it will work if, if that's what you've got available to you and you're more, more comfortable in that position. And then if you can get on and off the floor, the floor is a good place to stretch as well. So this guy on at the top here is doing a calf stretch. I'm sure every one of you has heard of the calf stretch before, stretching the heel cords. Um, you can do that in standing or like the one below, he's doing it in sitting. If you're unable to pull your foot back yourself, you can have, again, a family member, an aide, um, a very well-trained dog, <laughs> pull that foot up towards you. And then the muscles that I really think are most important to stretch are those hip flexors, which if you can see my mouse, they're kind of between the hips, the pelvis, and the top of that thigh. So when you're sitting, those are very shortened. They get very tight if you sit for a long time. If they're tight and you go to stand, it can put a lot of strain on your low back. So th this is something we really want to kind of pay attention to and make sure they're not getting too terribly tight. Um, hamstrings are the muscles underneath your leg, kind of from your bottom to the back of your knee. Um, they help you bend your knee. So if you notice your knees don't like to straighten all the way, that could be partially hamstring tightness. Um, if your legs really don't straighten all the way and you have knee contractures, I would still work on range of motion, but just know that stretching isn't going to necessarily fix that. Your quadriceps are the muscles on top of your legs. Those kind of go along with the hip flexors. Some of those muscles kind of work together um, and you can stretch them kind of by laying on your stomach and pulling your foot towards you or, um, well, they get a little challenging in sitting <laughs> and then your calves. And also sometimes I think we forget the forearms, wrists and hands um, because not everyone with Becker's hands are very effective, affected. I feel like some of you use them a lot and they can get really tight because you're using them more than than most of us would for some of our, our tasks to pull or help, you know, sit up um, to keep your grip on things. So stretching those forearms and wrists and a good one is just a simple prayer stretch like this. You can have someone push your hand back for you. Um, and if you notice your fingers are getting tight, either just laying it flat and pressing down to stretch it, or you're always going to get more stretch if your wrist is extended because then this muscle here, your flexors, running through those fingers. So if I pull back without keeping them straight, they're gonna curl. So pushing those hands out is where we get the most stretch in that position. And that just allows you to keep doing all of those, those independent ADLs using your joystick on your wheelchair, riding, gripping weights, grabbing a mug, um, you know, whatever your functional level is, that'll help. A little bit more on stretching here. So here's a good hamstring stretch exercise. I like to recommend this one, especially with kids, to sit in front of the couch um, on the floor while you're watching TV. It's a great way to you know, sit nice and tall, watch TV and let your hamstring stretch out. Um, this is a stretch for me and I'm fairly flexible. So if your knees bend a little bit, that's okay. Just keep your back nice and tall and kind of lean up against that. Um, if you prefer to do one leg at a time, this bottom one has, um, is a great example. Generally recommend doing it three times for 30 seconds, and that's per side, per body part. So if you're stretching your ankles, that's gonna be three times, 30 seconds for the right, three times, 30 seconds for the left. This, you don't necessarily wanna rush through stretching because you're not gonna get the benefit of it, and then it will just be wasted time. So take your time and do it right. Um, and if you, again, if you've been active, if you've participated in sports, if you've gone on a long walk, stretch a little longer, okay? Give those muscles what they need, um, even if that means a little more time. And that's kind of where planning your day around your activity comes, comes into play. 
um, if you're going to be active, you want to stretch. So make sure you've, you've got the time to do that. Um, and if you're feeling great, love stretching, doing them twice a day is even better. I know that does get hard with schedules, but it is really good for your muscles. And then if you have night shells or other forms of braces, wear them. You know, they were made to help you stretch. So if you can tolerate them while you sleep, wear them at night. If you can't tolerate them while you sleep, because I get it and sleep is important, um, put them on for a couple hours during the day while you're watching TV, while you're eating breakfast, while you're eating dinner, um, and allow yourself to stretch out without really thinking about it. Uh, joint mobility, kind of the same as we talked about earlier. Here's just a good picture describing like what sort of movements to do with your arm. You can go out to the side, up to the front, and back behind you. Standing in and of itself is a great form of stretching. Like I said, sitting all day makes those hips and knees very tight. So on your own throughout the day, or if you need a stander, or if you have a stander, um, and you can get out of your wheelchair up into a stander for a little bit, it's a great way to stretch out. It helps with your, um, with your bone, your bone development and, and um, preventing fractures to have that weight bearing through those bones. And then if you're gonna be sitting for a long period of time and you're able to get up, set a reminder to get up because, you know, like I said, the longer you sit, the tighter you get. If you on average sit longer than others and then you know you're gonna sit for an even longer time, so you're going to the movies or you're sitting down for a meeting, make sure that you recognize that it's gonna be harder to get up after that and try to, if you're able, get up during it to make it easier at the end. Another great hip flexor stretch is just honestly laying on your stomach like this guy on the bottom. If your hips are super, super tight and they don't touch the surface, that's gonna put a lot of strain on your back. Um, you can put a pillow under your stomach to kind of give you a little more space there. If this hurts your back, I wouldn't recommend doing it. Um, there are other ways that we can stretch out those hips, like laying on your side and having someone pull that knee back. Um, but that would be something, again, I would want you to talk to your PT or your physician specifically about because you know, that's going to be pretty specific to your mobility and how you move. And yeah, make sure you move throughout the day, move your joints. It's like dusting away the cobwebs. If we leave them in there, it gets really dirty and dusty and we can't get everything all cleaned out. And it just takes some extra work. If we do it every day, it stays nice and clean and moves really well. Okay, now we're getting into what to avoid. So specifically, we want to avoid excessive eccentric movements or lowering movements. So if you think about someone walking downhill, going down the stairs, um, if you're in a pull-up and you lower yourself down, that is an eccentric, eccentric movement. And the reason that we don't like eccentric movements for Duchenne and Becker and other muscular dystrophies is that they break down muscle. That when people are trying to bulk up and build muscle, they do a lot of eccentric movements and then take a lot of protein um, to build those muscles back up. But that is not how our, like how patients with Becker muscular dystrophies muscles react to that stress. Um, they don't always build back up. So we want to avoid that type of movement and that type of movement could be very painful and make you very sore. So if you're, I would just not focus on any eccentric exercises. If you see that word, just stay away from it. Um, avoid high intensity, high volume, or high impact activities. Um, and that's going to be relative to you and your mobility level. Something that's high impact for someone may not be high impact for someone else. But just don't push yourself to the point of fatigue. Um, we want you to be able to do your regular ADLs, your regular daily activities after you've done that exercise. And we also don't want you to be in pain. Um, and there's a difference between pain and soreness. And some soreness is okay. Uh, just, just make sure you know your body and know if you're pushing it too hard, you're gonna feel it the next day. And it's just very, very uncomfortable and that's not what we want. 
like again, a little soreness is fine, um, but too much is is too much. Um, and then know what to do if you do start feeling that pain. Is it a tension pain? You know, maybe you just need to stretch a little more. Um, if you're pushing too hard, rest. You know, take take some time off. Recognize that that pain is not correct, and adjust what exercises you're doing accordingly. Talk to your PT. Talk to your physician. Say, hey, this is bothering me. What what can we do instead? Um, and then positioning. You know, are you having pain because the position you're in is maybe not conducive to the exercise you're trying to do, or just position in general. You know, if, if you've been sitting for two hours and haven't moved, that can get uncomfortable. So are you able to reposition yourself in your wheelchair? That in and of itself can be an exercise and can be something you can work on with a physical therapist. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is just um, general activities. I understand that Everyone's lives are different, whether you are in school or you work um, or you stay home. What you do, what you want to get done in a day is going to be different for everyone. But I, my goal as a PT in a neuromuscle clinic is to make sure that you are able to do the things that you want to do and the things that you need to do successfully um, without being overly fatigued. So with that in mind, you have to think about what equipment is going to be beneficial. I know sometimes getting equipment can be a big hurdle. Um, same with asking for help. But if there are things that you want to do and you know that you're struggling with energy, um, getting a cane, getting a scooter, having someone get something off of a high shelf for you or pick something up off the floor for you is going to allow you to do more of the things that you want to do rather than pushing yourself through things that you have to do, if that makes sense. So make the things that you have to do easier on yourself. Um, so, and another thing that's really important is school and work participation. So are you able to participate fully in school and work? Um, do you need PT or OT in school? If you do, make sure that they know what, what to be working on, like what your goals are with your disability, um, and then make sure the teachers know what your goals are. If you can't carry books from classroom to classroom, can the teachers keep an extra set of books in that classroom for you? Um, those sorts of things. Same with your workplace. Uh, make sure that they're aware of your needs. Um, and the MDA and vocational rehab are great resources for helping you educate your workplace on, on what your needs are and how to um, adapt so that you can do your work as best as possible. And then last but not least are a couple um, different equipment that you know, these go from one side to the other of progression. You may never need any of these. You may be using all of these right now. Um, but just know that these are things that can make your life easier. I'm not necessarily going to go through all of them, but just, just wanted to give some ideas for you. So a cane or a walking stick, you know, if you need a little help, if your balance is just a little off, but you don't, you know, you can still go long distances that might be a good option. A scooter might be a good option. Um, if you need a power wheelchair, I would suggest getting one. That's, that's going to be something that makes your whole life that much easier. And it doesn't mean that you only can use that power wheelchair. It just means that you don't have to walk as far and you don't have to push yourself as hard. Um, and then some other fun ideas, you know, like a bidet. Very exciting stuff. But if that allows you to be more independent, and you know, not rely on others for certain hygiene activities, that might be a good option, something to invest in. Um, and then dry or waterless shampoo, if showering every day is challenging, that might be another way to maintain that independence. And then an accessible vehicle so that you can get and go and do all of the things that you wanna do. I know accessible vehicles are hard, they're expensive, um, but working with your local PT, OT, vocational rehab, the MDA, they will all have 
resources available to you to help you um, make those things happen. And if you have any questions on any of these pieces of equipment, just ask. I, I know them all very well. Um, and then he's, here are my sources. If you have any specific questions that you don't think of today, be, feel free to email me. Um, I can't promise I'll respond quickly, but I will get to it. Um, and that's my email there at the bottom. And I think that's it. Let's see if I can stop sharing. Thank you so much. I will move over to our and answer portion. We already have some questions in, so we will, I'll get to those now. The first question, Abby, is, well, first of all, thank you for your great presentation. Um, I'll get to the questions. What activities would be good for moderate to moderate severe backers? Do you have any examples? Um, depending on what you mean by moderate to severe, if you were non-ambulatory, um, I would say swimming, uh, hands down, swimming is the best activity, no matter who you are. You can always add a flotation device, um, have someone with you. If you don't like swimming, um, just range of motion. Someone can work through those range of motion, like that range of motion with you. Um, and then you can participate in as much of that range of motion as you can. Uh, and then those seated exercises, turning, reaching as far as you can, just getting your body moving. Uh, depending on what you mean by, you know, moderate to moderate severe, like what exact, what your functional limitations are, I would talk to your, your doctor or your, if you have a physical therapist or an MDA care center and see if they can connect you with someone who could work specifically with you. Um, that's going to be the, the best way to get, get you something that works for you. Okay, next question is, what was the word you, you used at the beginning of your presentation that explained lack of muscle use? Um, disuse. So I, I think that's what you mean. Um, so if you, you know, no use is disuse um, and we have disuse atrophy. So the muscles, I think it's within two weeks of not being active of, you know, if you were to sit on your couch within two weeks, you would start to lose muscles just from, from not using them. Yeah, that was the word that he was looking for. So perfect. Is there a book or pamphlet or other resources available with exercise and activity ideas? I believe the MDA has some online some exercise ideas um, as far as specific activities i do believe cure duchenne has um, exercise and stretching videos as well and while those are a little bit more geared toward duchenne you know becker and duchenne are, are cousins in in a way so a lot of those activities will be appropriate um, I don't know of any other specific pamphlets. Maybe that's something I can work on. There's a, there is a resource available on mda.org. It is geared towards DMD, but like you said, DMD and BMD are cousins. It's called At Home PT for DMD, and it's also available in Spanish. Okay, next question. Is using an exercise ball or gym ball useful in BMD? Um, are you talking like a big, one of those big, we call them physio balls that you could sit on? Um, in which case, yes, that's great for core strength. It's, it's great for balance. Um, I wouldn't do anything too crazy on it. You know, if, if your balance is already challenged and we don't want you to fall off of it. That's, that's my, my biggest concern. If you're thinking more like a, a medicine ball, if that's something that you're capable of using, I'm, I'm all for it. Just don't push yourself to, you know, unsafe reps. Don't push yourself to fatigue. We don't want pain. And I don't want you to put that ball over your head if your shoulders are unstable. Um, 
those are the only two exercise balls I can think of. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're right. Uh, next question, how much time should it be spent in a standing frame per week? Um, again, that's, that's going to be person to person. If you're already using the standing frame and you're able to stand in that for an hour, whether it's, you know, while you're reading a book, watching TV, eating dinner, and you can do that daily, I think that's fine. 30 minutes to an hour a day, if you can tolerate it. Um, by no means do you need to stay in it all day, every day, but it is a really good stretch and, and a, a really good for that bone density. Another question coming in is, do you have any ideas on how to pay for assistive equipment? Loads, but <laughs> again, it is, is it's um, dependent on your situation. If you are going to, like if you're working or if you're in school, vocational rehab's a great resource. Um, they can, help you figure out how to get a lot of different pieces of equipment. Um, if you have an MDA representative in your area, they may know, you know, specific to you. You know, if you're in New York, there may be something there in your area where they offer grants. There may be different foundations that can help with that. Um, and then also talk to whatever county you're in. A lot of times the disability, um, like social security disability office can help with that as well. Another question coming in is asking what a Hoyer is. A Hoyer lift. Um, a Hoyer lift is like a mini crane. <laughs> so this would be more if, if you're no longer ambulatory and you struggle to transfer yourself, it's just a safer way to get someone out of their chair and into bed and vice versa. Um, oftentimes it takes one to two people uh, and you'll, you'll need to be rolled or you'll need to roll yourself to get into the sling and then it just lifts you and places you in the next um, location. Another question we have is, if someone with MD has not been active, can they still build muscle with increased exercise? Yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, just like anyone else, you just have to recognize that there are specific limitations to building muscle surrounding your diagnosis um, and that you're only going to get um, you're only going to get back what you have available. So if you haven't exercised in a while, you know, you may not get back to where you were before that, but you may be able to build, build some strength back. We did have a comment come in from an attendee that said, I work for vocational rehab and typically we help with things that are needed for you to go to work. So find your vocational rehab for that. Here is another question. Is it possible to permanently damage muscles by stretching or range of motion? How do you know when you're overdoing? Um, I'm sure it is, especially if you've got contractures or are very, very, very tight. Generally, if you are pushing yourself to that point, it's going to be painful. So that's where that don't push through pain comes in. Um, most of the time people can differentiate between stretching pain where it, it's just kind of that tension. You can just feel it pulling and it might be a little bit of discomfort, but it's not pain. Um, but if you're going through range of motion or stretching and you feel a sharp pain, you're probably doing too much. And at that point, just back off until you feel just that the beginning of that tension or discomfort. Thank you. Here's another one. Do you know of any good light night splints? By saying that five times fast. <laughs> um, not specifically off of my off the top of my head. I know we generally go through our orthotist for that, but I understand what you mean. My brothers are heavy. He's also six one, so <laughs> there's a a lot of material there. But I, I understand what you mean by that. Um, I would ask 
your orthotist, they're going to know best. I don't make them, so I, I don't know what materials are available. Is it important to keep hydrated and drink lots of water? Yes, and this is a big thing, um, especially if transfers are hard for you and you need assistance, because oftentimes patients, whether you have muscular dystrophy or you've recently had a stroke or you know whatever your mobility limitation is, people will not drink because it is a burden you know, they feel that it's a burden to need, like, to get help to go to the bathroom. Um, but you just need to be open and communicate with those you're working with, your care partners, your family members, and say, hey, you know, how can we make this bathroom transfer easier so that I can drink the water I need in a day? Um, or get yourself a nice little handy urinal. Okay, we have about three minutes left for questions and we still have a few to go. So um, our next question is, can stretching correct tightness that has developed from being in a wheelchair seated position for some time? To a degree. Um, I think that's where we start to get contractures and, and like I kind of touched on earlier, contractures are, are very, very hard to minimize with stretching alone. Um, and that is why I, I do try and recommend as much mobility and stretching as you can while you've got it. Um, but that's not to say not to stretch if you have been sitting. That's where, again, that PT or that, that physician coming in will come in handy because they'll be able to walk you through what positions you can stretch in. So whether it's laying on your side and having someone move that leg kind of behind you to get that stretch um, or having someone straighten your knee out in the wheelchair. You know, you, you might need a little more guidance with those if, if you haven't stretched in a while, but I would still definitely stretch because even if you can't get all of that range of motion back, it can relieve some of the tightness and, and prevent pain and further issues. When in school for physical therapy, how much is taught about neuromuscular diseases? Oh, this is my favorite topic. Um, when we were in PT school, I did most of the teaching about Becker and Duchenne. Um, <laughs> they told us that if we saw a kid who was you know, behind in development and have what's called a Gower sign, so you walk your hands from the floor up your legs to stand to let the physician know because they might have a neuromuscle disease. Um, we learned a little bit about spinal muscular atrophy and honestly that was about it. Um, and that's why I think it's so awesome that the MDA has care centers where they request that a PT be present because while we were not trained in PT school, we have taken the time to learn and figure out the differences um, in these neuromuscular diseases and how to share that information, not only with the families, but also with, with your PTs as well. Um, a lot of pediatric PTs have learned these diseases over the years because they are more pediatric diseases. Um, but, you know, obviously adults have them too, and it is harder to find an adult PT who is well-versed in, in neuromuscular diseases. And we definitely appreciate you, Abby, being a part of um, the MDA Care Center. What is your take on playing video games for exercise with your arms and hands? I think it is definitely work. Um, I would stretch that, you know, not so much on your arms if you're, you know, just working those fingers. Um, I don't know that I would, 100% count that as your activity for the day. Um, if you get really into it and your arms are going out with it and maybe a little more, but definitely stretch your hands. Um, a lot of times boys will come into the clinic and these two fingers will be very, very tight because they play video games all day. <laughs> so that's where that stretching comes in really handy to make sure that you can still do all those things using the video games, joystick, phones, um, yeah, all of that. 
we have time for one final question. Um, I have a four-year-old son that has Becker's. What exercises would be good for someone so young? I, unless he's having specific difficulties, challenges um, related to either like calf tightness or weakness, uh, I wouldn't necessarily limit him or focus on anything in, in particular. If he is struggling with certain things like climbing stairs or getting off the floor, you know, those might be things to work on, but just let him be active and play because he'll, you know, he'll self limit if it's too much. And at that age, oftentimes Becker isn't, isn't too terribly severe. So just let him go, let him play. We have a few comments coming and saying thank you, Abby. And yes, thank you so much, Abby, for your expertise and your time and everything you do for the BMD community. We really appreciate it. I want to also thank our event sponsor, Edgewise. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support. So thank you very much. If anyone does have questions after this webinar, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we'll follow up with you. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar, Physical Therapy and Becker Muscular Dystrophy. Thank you very much for attending and thank you so much, Abby, for being a part of the webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day.